Okay, good evening everybody. We're going to wait for our friends, our students, our neighbors to get online. <clears throat> So as many of you may, may know, uh, Houston has been faced with a very challenging uh, weather forecast. Um, more than forecast, it's been uh, really a dangerous roads here. It's freezing uh, with uh, ice and uh, there's sleet. And uh, therefore the streets are mostly empty. And we felt that it would be a little bit too dangerous for if you're here, if you can just thumbs up or write that you're here so we can see you. And uh, so we're just gonna wait for a few people to, to, to uh, populate the, uh, the live broadcast so we can get, get going with our regular weekly class. As we've said numerous times, Torah never stops. Even if we have an ice storm in Houston, the rarity of that uh, still doesn't stop our on going learning. Hello Karen, hello uh, Adam and April, hello Susan. I, I said Karen but I shouldn't say Karen, I should say Yael. Thank you so much Yael for joining us. Good evening Camden, good evening Gigal, good evening Stephen. So we're just waiting for a few people. Uh, you can't hear me? <clears throat> Anything wrong with the sound? Can you hear me now? Anyone hear me now? Hello? All right, all right. I see some, some, some action here. If you are able to hear me, Susan, problem solved. Okay, excellent. Good evening, Esther. Welcome aboard. And uh, we're just going to wait for a few more people, and we're going to get started. As soon as, we, as soon as we have a minion of uh, 10 people, we'll get started. Okay, you hear me? That's good. Excellent. Let's get this. Let's get this going, so we can get started. Okay. So I, I promised last week that I would have notes for everybody of uh, the the outline of the five books in five weeks, and I apologize that I don't have it for you tonight because tonight we're we're not having our regular programming from the Torch Center. We're having it uh, virtual and online only. So uh, I'm gonna. You're gonna have to. <clears throat> You're going to have to come next week to get all the notes. Next week will be the fifth of the five books in five weeks. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get, uh, get it all finished. If not, we'll add a week and we'll have five books in six weeks. Okay. So last week we left off at the end of the book of Genesis. And we're going to, we're going to do the last four portions, which is Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, and Vayichi. And in this, in this, in these uh, four, four last four portions are dealing with Joseph and his brothers. So we have as follows: Joseph's dreams. He has dreams of the stars. He has dreams of the piles, and all of them were sort of giving over the the uh, notion that he's going to be a leader, and that his siblings. Uh, will be bowing down to him. We'll see later on that it was a prophecy, um, and it was true. It turned out to be true. So you would know also that he was a favored son of, of uh, Jacob. Joseph was a favored son, and he was the firstborn of Rachel. And we know that he had the firstborn rights uh, because he was the first, the first uh, born. So he was given sort of like a double portion already from his father. Uh, as we know, his mother was Rachel with a chosen wife. Uh, the, 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 uh, I guess we'd say the, the, um, this is the wife that Joseph really chose, that Jacob really chose, even though um, he married Leah and had uh, two other concubines. But either way, Joseph gets the beautiful coat, and the brother's hatred towards Joseph intensifies. Joseph is put into the pit. And Joseph is later sold. And then we have the story of Judah and Tamar, his, his uh, former daughter-in-law. And then Joseph is sold to Egypt. Now, we discussed this in greater depth back when we spoke about this in the Breakneck Through the Bible class. 
but just the idea that Joseph is sent down to Egypt, you know, we all are faced with challenges, and many times we don't understand why we have to face certain challenges. And what the Torah is teaching us here is that even though you might not see it, even though Joseph may not have seen it at the time, but there is a reason. And the reason was a good reason because that was the, the future salvation of the Jewish people. So, you know, it, it may have seemed to Joseph as being a very bitter experience, being sent down to Egypt, being exiled from his family. But this was the beginning of the Jewish people being able to get out of Egypt, you know, over 200 years later. So Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. Joseph was a very handsome young man. And that was also one of the, the critical moments in Joseph's life where he had to stay strong. We all have these opportunities, these times where it's difficult, where we have difficulties, where we have to make. And what our sages tell us is that sometimes those are your life decisions. Those are the experiences that are going to shape your future. And our sages tell us that had Joseph uh, fallen to that temptation, uh, perhaps he would not even be mentioned in the Torah. But he stayed strong, which is why he was the only of the tribes who was called Yosef HaTzadik, Yosef the Righteous, um, uh, because he was able to, to stay strong. Uh, he was imprisoned. He interprets the dreams for the cupbearer and the baker. And one of the interesting things is that we see that the, uh, the, the, the baker uh, is, is told by, he's told by uh, Joseph in the, in the interpretation that he was going to die. And the obvious question is, how did, how did Joseph know that? How did Joseph know that he was going to die? So our sages tell us that what did he say? What was his dream? If you look at his dream, his dream was, of the baker was that a bird came and ate from his basket of bread. Our sages explain, you know, typically a bird doesn't come and eat from the basket of a living human being. But when a bird is not afraid and is able to eat from a basket with what seems to be a person there, that must be that the person's not living. So that's how Joseph knew that the baker was not going to live. Now, the next portion is Miketz, the 10th portion in Genesis, uh, is dealing with Pharaoh's dream, and Joseph interprets the dreams that seven years of prosperity will be followed by seven years of famine. And this is what our, 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 our I've actually heard this from another rabbi, even though I've been saying it for years, but I recently heard that, yes, this is the first sign in the Torah to have a savings account. It's important for every person to know that, you know, we're not always going to have fruitful years in the sense of our livelihoods. And it's worthwhile for, for, for us to think for the future that perhaps there may be difficult times. Perhaps, you know, we may arrive at times that are not going to be so pleasant. And therefore, we need to prepare for it. So this is where, where Pharaoh is getting a lesson on economics from Joseph. And Joseph is telling him, as the viceroy, uh, just FYI, there are going to be seven great years, but then there are going to be seven years filled with poverty. And during those seven years of poverty, you're not going to have a, a famine. And during those seven years of famine, you're not going to have what to feed the entire country. So let's think in advance. Put away that, that, uh, that wealth that we have so that we can provide for ourselves in the future. And that turns out to be the savior of Egypt. Right? Because during those seven years of famine, Joseph's idea, Joseph became the leader at the time. There was only one seat above him, and that was the seat of Pharaoh. So he was taken out of prison. Uh, Joseph becomes the viceroy after revealing this dream to Pharaoh uh, and interpreting it for him. There's a famine in the land, and Joseph sends, uh, Jacob sends his other sons, his ten other sons, to Egypt to provide food for the family back in Canaan which is today known as the land of Israel. So the brothers bow to Joseph, which, as we said in the beginning of tonight's class, was the begin it was a prophecy. So the brothers bow to Joseph, and Joseph gives them a very difficult time, and they return home to pick up their brother Benjamin, and, you know, it, Joseph interrogates them. It turns out that Joseph didn't even know 
that he had a younger brother, but he was in his interrogation, found out that they had a younger brother. And what he wanted to see, our sages tell us, he wanted to see if it's possible that his brothers did repent because they treated him poorly and they wanted to know maybe all the children of Rachel that there were to be, it turns out there were only two, Joseph and Benjamin, but maybe, uh, maybe uh, they wouldn't treat Benjamin nicely just like they didn't treat him nicely. And when they saw that they were so committed and they were ready to go all the way back to pick up Benjamin and then to protect Benjamin, was, as we'll see in the next portion, how Judah steps up to the plate and is ready to battle uh, almost with Joseph. So we, he saw, wow, they are really serious about protecting their brother. They really did repent appropriately and therefore we'll see that he reveals himself immediately after that. So in the 11th portion in Genesis, we see that Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers. Pharaoh joins the welcome. Joseph sends gifts to his father. And then Jacob, his father, journeys down to Egypt. A total of 70 descendants go down with uh, Jacob. So there's a total of 70 descendants. Jacob meets Joseph. And just to talk for a second about this, uh, this uh, meeting between uh, Joseph and uh, Jacob. So it says, you know, our sages tell us that uh, Joseph, when he met his father, his father didn't just run over to him and give him a hug and a kiss. Oh, my son, I haven't seen you in forever. His father says the Shema. His father takes that moment of such incredible love. And instead of just, you know, hugging his son and kissing his son, he says, I need to recognize that this is a tremendous gift from the Almighty. And as we said many times in our classes, Judaism is not a religion. Judaism is a relationship. And even in such incredible moments, we have to remember our relationship with God. Things that may seem to us as a, as a terrible thing, that now Jacob has to go down to, to Egypt. Look how great it turned out for him. He gets to see his son, who for 22 years he mourned his death even though he didn't die but he was told the story that he that that, that his son died his son joseph uh, J uh, joseph died he, which he didn't so jacob meets joseph and it's a really an incredible moment of love between uh, jacob and joseph but also between jacob and the almighty um and this was a, a, an unbelievable time but he also meets uh, jacob meets pharaoh and Jacob, Jacob, as the Torah tells us, was turning, getting old, and his eyes were weak. And that, in biblical terms, equals he was blind. Uh, now, just an interesting thing is that between the Parsha, the 11th and the 12th portion, of between Vayigash and Vayichi, there is no separation in the Torah. And the Torah goes straight. It just continues. Usually, you have... A separation of about uh, I don't remember the exact number of letters between uh, each portion, but here there's no let no no space be of letters or lines between portions. It just keeps on going. And our sages tell us, and that is because when Moses was writing the Torah, so Pharaoh was dictating the Torah to Moses, and Moses is writing and writing and writing and writing, and then you know, between each portion, he would take some time just to review, to internalize, to, to reflect. But when the Jewish people descended to Egypt, there's nothing to reflect about how they're going to ever get out. How are they going to get out of Egypt? This is, this, this is going to be crazy, right? This is going to be an endless, there's nothing to think about. In such times, our sages tell us, it's only faith. In such times, we just have to put our emunah, put our trust in the Almighty, and only the Almighty has the answers. We can't always know the answers in advance. So in such a case, Moshe says, What's, what am I going to waste time trying to think about and reviewing and understanding? There's no time to think. It's all the hands of the Almighty how this is going to unfold. So in portion number 12 of Genesis, is Vayichi, the last portion of, of the book of Genesis, we have that Jacob requests for burial in the land of Israel. He makes Joseph promise to him that he will bury him in the land of Egypt. 
And what our, what our sages tell us is really incredible that um, later on we'll see that after Jacob dies, uh, after Jacob passes away, Pharaoh tells Joseph, go to the, to, to the land of Canaan and go bury your father just like he promised, just like you promised. And the obvious question uh, that begs to be asked is, why does Pharaoh care about his promise? I mean, why should it interest Pharaoh whether or not Joseph keeps or does not keep the promise that he made to his father? And especially we see that Pharaoh wasn't exactly the nicest, kindest, uh, most uh, delicate person to care about people's private promises they make. So our sages tell us an incredible idea. I heard this from my brother, Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, who will be teaching uh, tonight at 8 o'clock his five book and five millennia class that was scheduled for tonight as well at the Torah Center. And he instead will teach it on Facebook as well. Uh, on his page, I will have it shared here shortly. Um, or if someone has that link from the email, you can please share it here so other people can click on it. At 8 o'clock, you will go live. Um, from from his location. So my brother shared with me this idea that, you know, to be a king of Egypt, to be a pharaoh, you needed to speak all 70 languages. But pharaoh didn't speak all 70 languages. And the only person who knew that he was missing one language, the lang language, the holy language of the Jewish people, Lashon HaKodesh, was Joseph. Joseph knew that pharaoh didn't speak that language. And he made a promise to Pharaoh that he would not tell anyone that Pharaoh was really illegitimate in the sense of being qualified to be king of Egypt. So Pharaoh thought to himself correctly, if Joseph will get to a point where he doesn't fulfill his promises, who knows? Maybe my promise he won't either keep. Meaning when we have something that's important to us and we suddenly break it, you know, it's like a diet. You think of a diet. So you're taking a diet, you're, you're on a diet, and then you break a little bit of the diet. So then sometimes it's very easy for you to continue breaking it. You say, you know what, it's not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. It's just one, two, three, before you know it, it's all over. Pharaoh was afraid that if Joseph is going to get into the habit of breaking promises, then who knows where it's going to end up? He's going to end up revealing my promise as well. So therefore, Pharaoh was very adamant about Joseph not breaking that promise and fulfilling that promise by going to the land of Israel or land of Canaan and burying his father. Now, we see over here that uh, Jacob gives blessings and Jacob gives blessings to his, his children and to his two grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh, and he also says that that through you, your descendants will bless their children. And that is that when we say a blessing to our children, to our sons particularly, we say, May God make you like or bless you like Ephraim and Menashe. So there are many, many questions as to why specifically Ephraim and Menashe would be chosen. And we've discussed this in the past. And that is because Ephraim and Menashe were the only one of the tribes or the children of the tribes who didn't grow up in a house of Jewish living. I mean, they grew up in the king's palace, right? They grew up in Joseph's home. And they did not exactly have a synagogue in Egypt where they lived. They didn't have a learning center. They certainly did not have a torch center there. And, you know, you just, where were they going to learn? Where were they going to grow? But still, but still, they became great people. They became great scholars. They became great uh, people in their relationship with the Almighty. And our sages tell us that for this reason, they were chosen specifically because the Jewish people at some point will be all over the world. Jews are in, you know, you know, in, in all over Russia and Jews are in Australia and, you know, all over Asia and Europe and, and Africa and America, the North America, South America. Jews are all over the world. Wherever you are, we should have our blessing like Ephraim and Menashe. They were also away from the Jewish habitat. They were also away from a Jewish community. And yet they succeeded. Now, for girls, people make the blessing uh, when they bless their daughters. They should be like Sarah, Rachel, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Um, and some also add, like myself, we add 
because the Torah tells us to bless our children by Ephraim and Menashe, so we bless by Ephraim and Menashe, and Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Okay, but that blessing uh, is alive and kicking today in every Jewish, Jewish household, Friday night. Uh, there is a custom to bless our children uh, prior to Kiddush, Friday night. It's a very special custom, and if you want the, the text, you can find it anywhere online for the blessing for uh, for for the children. Then Joseph, then Jacob dies, and is mourned by all of Egypt because he was recognized to be a great person. It's very interesting that uh, spirituality is tangible by is 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 able to be identified by even people who are not so spiritual. Uh, even a, a, a lowly Egypt was able to recognize in the greatness of Jacob. So they all mourned Jacob's passing. And as we discussed a few minutes ago, uh, Joseph went to Egypt um, and he receives permission by Pharaoh to go bury his father. The tribes bury Jacob in the land of Canaan. Joseph reassures his brothers that they have nothing to fear, that even though their father is away, they shouldn't think that only because Jacob was alive, Joseph will, 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 uh, will take care of them and will be nice to them. Joseph reassures them, and this is what a true leader understands his, uh, his uh, followers, and he understands his, his, uh, his, um, his, his people. Joseph understood that his brothers may be fearful for their lives, that now he will take revenge. And Joseph understood this and therefore reassured his siblings, don't worry, even though our father passed, and even though I could potentially take revenge, I'm not going to. Um, and then shortly after that, we know the Torah relates that Joseph died and he made the Jewish people promise that he will not remain buried in Egypt, but rather his bones will be taken to the land of Israel. And as many of you know, the city of Nablus, uh, Shechem, is where is the city that was given to Joseph, and that's where Joseph is buried today. Um, uh, when you, when you visit Israel next, make sure that you go uh, visit the 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 tomb of uh, uh, the gravesite of Joseph Hatzadik. Uh, but make sure you have security with you. So we just concluded the book of Genesis. We're going to continue with the book of, of Exodus in one minute. But I just as a quick summary, we had 12 portions, 50 chapters, and 1,534 verses. Okay, now we begin Shemos, Exodus. Now, the book of Exodus deals with the nation of Israel. Right? This is the... The, the forming of the nation of Israel. Till now, we were talking about the family of Israel, but now it's the nation of Israel and the most important revelation ever in the world, and that's the revelation of God at Mount Sinai. So there are 11 portions in this book of uh, Exodus, and we begin with the book, with the, with the portion of, Shem, of Shemot. And uh, the first four portions are dealing with the Jews in Egypt. So that's Shmot Ve'era Bo'an B'Shalach. The first one dealing with this enslavement. The second dealing with this, excuse me, with the first seven plagues. And then Bo dealing, which is this week's Parsha that we uh, coincide with the reading uh, of Parsha's Bo in this week, this week in all synagogues across the world, they'll be reading this coming uh, portion of Bo. And that's the three plagues, the three remaining plagues of the ten plagues. We also have the Exodus, the Jews getting out of Egypt. And then in Beshalach, the sea splits, and that's the Egypt out of the Jews. Okay, so let's begin. So the generation passes. You know, there's many times that we have where, where we think that we have it all worked out. We have it worked out for ourselves. We have it worked out for our families. We have it worked out for our descendants, for our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And then there's a uh, change of regime. Or then there's a change of, there's a new boss. There's a new, a new emperor. There's a new manager in your bank, and suddenly he's like, who are you? No privileges here. You get nothing, right? You start like anybody else. And you're like, what do you mean? I had years of relationship here. So what the Torah tells us here at the beginning of the book of, of, of uh, Shemot is that the new Pharaoh, it's not necessarily that this was a new person, but there was a new approach. There was a new era after the passing of Joseph. That's it. The Jewish people didn't get any favors on, because of Joseph but rather they had all new set of rules. 
So Pharaoh is worried that the Jewish people are going to, the, remember we, we said that they came down as 70 people. Jacob, his family, a total of 70 people. They came down to Egypt. And today, you know, at the point of Shemos, uh, they were having many, many children, and they were becoming a very, a very big uh, people, a big uh, minority, soon to be a majority, which was what Pharaoh was afraid of. So he says, we got to figure out something. And he plots to, uh, to limit the Jewish people and their strength in his land. So we know infanticide uh, was instituted, and any baby boy that's born should be thrown into the Nile. And of course, Moses is born, but Moses is saved. He's saved. Princess of Pharaoh uh, finds and raises Moses inside the inside the the compound of Pharaoh. Moses feels the suffering of his people, and this is one of the uh, leadership qualities that we've discussed in the past. That to be a leader, it's not just to be a great orator. It's not just to be a a dynamic personality, but you have to really feel the pain of your people. This was the quality, even though Moses was not a great orator. Moses may have had other flaws, but his quality was that he was able to feel the pain of his people. He flees to Midian after burying the Egyptian uh, who was fighting with the Jew. Moses marries Zipporah. The time for salvation has come, and Moses the shepherd uh, and the liberator uh, is called to action. God appears in a burning bush, and God mandates him to return to Egypt to bring them to the land of Israel. And interestingly, Moses himself doesn't get to go to the land of Israel, but his job is to bring them, bring them to the doorstep of the land of Israel. Moses hesitates because he doesn't feel like he's worthy. God reassures him, you're the right guy. Moses, Moses prepares a uh, request for Pharaoh, uh, Moses doubts his people's faith and he's not sure whether or not they're going to withstand this tri this trial and this uh, this challenge. Moses, Moses doubts his ability to articulate and God, of course, um, gives a response saying, go with your brother. Go with your brother, he'll help you out. Moses heads to Egypt. Zipporah, his wife, circumcises their son. And uh, they come to Pharaoh. Pharaoh increases the burden upon the Jewish people. He thinks, uh, in an interesting way, uh, Pharaoh understands the way the Jewish people work. When we have free time, right, we can rebel. When we're working, we don't have time to think, and we just we just work. Um, our our sages talk about this. Our Muslim masters talk about uh, how much we need to be in control of our own time how we need to make sure that we have time to focus. If we're too busy being busy, like the world is today, it's a very big challenge for us as Jews because we don't have time to focus on our relationship with the Almighty. We don't have time to focus on God. We don't have to, time to focus on our relationship with God, which is essentially what we said earlier is the religion of the Jewish people, right? We're not a religion, we're a relationship. And that is what's important for us in, in, uh, in always having the time to be able to think of our relationship with God, to plot out how we're going to grow and connect. So, Moses heads to Egypt. Pharaoh, uh, uh, okay, we said that. Pharaoh uh, increases the burden. The Jewish people complain. And uh, God tells Moses to watch the show. Sit back and relax. The second portion of Va'era uh, deals with the seven plagues. God reassures Moshe again, right? And the four expressions of redemption, I will take you out of slavery. I'll, t I'll take you out. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. And I will choose you, right? And take you out of slavery before redemption. I will rescue you from Egypt. I will redeem you by splitting the city. And I will choose you as my nation. And those are the four expressions that are also the four cups of wine that we drink at the Pesach Seder. Moshe hesitates again, and the redemption begins. The onslaught of the ten plagues against the Egyptians begins, and the ten plagues start. We have the first seven plagues, 
And as I promised, I will have it for everyone next week when we're back at the center. And for those of you who just joined us, you may not understand why we have this class only online and we don't have this class at the Torch Center as we usually do every week. Because in Houston, we are suffering from a terrible, uh, cold, terribly cold weather, one which is very un, un, uh, seasonable in Houston, or at least uncommon in Houston. And the roads are very slippery. It's very dangerous. And therefore, we decided to stay safe and to keep everyone comfortable at home. Um, and we'll provide this class instead online. So I hope you're all enjoying. And uh, we're going to continue here um, with, the, with the 10 plagues. Now, I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that we see that the creation of the world was 10 utterances. God gave 10 utterances, and those utterances created the world. Our sages tell us that the 10 utterances all correspond to one of the 10 plagues as well. And each one of the plagues represents one of the creations that the Egyptians were denying. Um, so it was sort of a midah connected midah, an act for an act or an eye for an eye. Here they were refuting God. The Egyptians did not want to recognize God in these areas, and God paid them back with punishment specifically, as we see. The first was first three were from the water, the second three were from the land, and the last and, and the other three were from the from the he, from the sky, and then of course the last the, the, the death of the firstborn. And we'll see that in a few minutes we'll go through each of the ten plagues. So the first set of three demonstrate God's uh, exist the existence of Hashem. That is the blood, the frogs, and the lice. The second set of three demonstrates that God's providence extends over everything, the wild beasts, the plague of the wild beasts, the epidemics, the epidemic of the animals, right, all died. And then we have the boils. And then the third set of three demonstrates that God's power is unmatched. And the first of the three is hail, which is in this week's parsha of Vaera. But then in Bo, which is actually... This this week's parsha, like what we're going to read in our synagogues this week, is Parsha's Bo, which is the third portion in in Exodus. So we have the final three plagues, and that is the locusts, the darkness, and finally the harshest plague, the death of the firstborn. Now Pharaoh was warned about each plague um, in advance, and Pharaoh was given the option. And the question is obviously asked: He was given an option. Do you want to let the people, the Jewish people out? And he says, no, I don't want to. And it says, the Torah tells us that, um, the Torah tells us that Hashem told Moshe, don't worry, I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh. So we know one of the principles we discussed in the introduction to Torah, I think it was in part one and part two of this series of the Torah Crash Course, was that we have free will. Free will is one of the great gifts that God gave us uh, in, 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 in our creation of this world. So how can God play with Pharaoh's free will? So there are a number of answers to this, but I think one of the important answers to, to recognize and keep in mind is that if you saw the greatest miracles on earth being shown to you, would you have any doubts? Of course not. So the only way to balance out and to get you know, Pharaoh's uh, ability to have free will, to be on an even level, was for God to harden his heart. And then it would be at an even, because suddenly you have miracles that are all the way up here. So with a, in a normal person's perspective, it would be impossible for them not to see the hand of God. So God had to harden his heart to get it to the point where he can have an equal balanced free will, equal good, equal bad, opposing each other. So we have uh, Pharaoh's warned about the plague of the firstborn at about midnight, not midnight, but about midnight, midnight, God says, I'm going to kill all the firstborn. And so what, it's an interesting term. We know that there's no extra letter in the Torah. There's no extra word in the Torah. How is it possible that God doesn't write at midnight, exactly midnight? Because as we all know, if I tell you all, all of you right now, okay, please tell me what time it is on your watch right now, right? So for me, it's two minutes fast. So it's 7.37, but oh, 
And for some of you, it might be 736 and 735 and 737, 734, 732. You know, you have a slow watch, you got to change your battery. It's 730 or 725. Either way, everyone's going to have a different time. So therefore, God understood that if, if people will look at this as being the greatest revelation, this whole experience, what's going to happen is that every person is going to see. If God said at midnight, it's midnight, God says no. It's at about midnight. So for one person, it's exactly midnight. For the other person, it's in another 20 seconds. For another person, it'll be three minutes ahead, three minutes behind, and so on and so forth. So that's why the Torah is very careful for every word. And it says, at about midnight. The festival of Passover is, Passover is declared, and Pharaoh surrenders. Finally, the exodus, after 210 years of slavery, um, goes into effect, the Jewish people are out of Egypt, and the mitzvah of daily remembrance of the Exodus. And we're going to see something very interesting in two more portions. We're going to talk about the Ten Commandments, and we'll see something very interesting. So we have many mitzvahs that are taught to us in this week's parasha, and a parasha of Bo, and that is, we have the mitzvah of tefillin, we have the mitzvah of a calendar, we have the mitzvah of, of, of counting the months. And by the way, tonight is also a tremendous evening because tonight is Rosh Chodesh. So good Chodesh to everyone, a good month to everyone. Uh, tonight is the beginning of the month of Shvat. Uh, tomorrow will act, not tomorrow, but on Thursday. Today is Tuesday. Thursday will be um, the first day of the month of Shvat. So we have like this, and that is the end of the third portion of, of Bo in Exodus. Then we have the fourth portion, which talks about the splitting of the sea, and the Jewish people are, are en route to Egypt, to, to, to Eretz Yisrael, the land of the promised land of the Jewish people. Pharaoh changes his mind and says, no, I'm going to get those Jews and I'm going to get them back. Um, a little bit, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uh, funny that he thinks he's going to get the Jewish people back into the land. But that's, you know, people think irrational and they do things. We, it's like um, one of the things that we'll get to, one of the topics we'll get to on Muslim Mondays is uh, anger. When people are angry, they do stupid things. When Pharaoh got angry here, he did a stupid thing. He thinks he's going to run after the Jewish people and get them. But the Jewish people panic and uh, God reassures them. And we know Nachshon goes in, and he gets the water goes all the way to his nostrils, and then the sea splits. And he was rewarded for that because uh, he showed a tremendous level of, of uh, he showed a tremendous level of commitment and belief and trust in Hashem. Hashem said he's going to split the sea. He went in, and the sea, the, the sea is going to split, whether or not it makes sense or doesn't make sense. The Egyptians drown. We know. The Jews cross on dry land. It's very interesting that in the song of Az Yashir that we say in the morning in our verses of praise uh, prior to the blessings of, of the Shema every morning in our morning services, we sing the Az Yashir. And in that it says that God passed us through the sea on dry land. Why does that have to be on dry land? It could be muddy land. It could be, because, you know, scientists have come up with many theories as to how the sea was split. And yeah, if you have a wind coming from here and a wind coming from there and together, it will make that you can split any type of water. That may be true. But you will not be able to have that the water, that the land beneath that water that is split, that that will be dry. And that was a miracle that God added to the miracle of the splitting of the sea is that it was also dry land. So, towards the end of the portion of Beshalach, we have um, the salvation, the Jews sing the song by the sea, the Az Yashir, and the Jews are tested with the bitter waters, they receive the manna, they have preparation for Shabbos, the first, I guess the first Shabbos that they're about to experience, even though, as, as, uh, as we learn, the Midrash tells us that they were not forced to work on Shabbos, who's one of the negotiating uh, uh, specialties of Moses is that he goes over to Pharaoh and he says, listen, you want hard workers, right? If you're going to work them, work them, work them, work them every single day, they're going to be less productive. 
He says it's in your best interest that you give them a day off. You know, he's like, Pharaoh says, Moses, you're brilliant. Right? What day should I give off? He says, you know what, maybe give the seventh day off. Every seventh day they should have a day off. And that was, of course, Moses nego negotiating that the Jewish people should have one day a week where they can have their relationship with Hashem, and that was the day of Shabbos. But here they're able to observe the Shabbos, not in, in, in Egypt, but here in, 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 out in the open, in the wilderness, in the desert, and re receiving that manna. And we know that the Jewish people received two portions of manna for Shabbat, and that's why we have two chalos that we make the blessing of Hamotzi on, on Shabbat, both Shabbos evening and Shabbos day. And then the water came from the rock. Why did it come from the rock? We mentioned this as well, because it was a punishment that, uh, you know, God has many creative ways that the Jewish people can get water, but specifically from a rock is very interesting. So it's because our sages tell us that Abraham could have served those three angels who came to his tent when he was healing from the circumcision. Abraham could have given them the water himself, but he didn't. He asked his servant, go get the water for the, for the visitors. God says, if you're sending your servants at the level that you're at, you should have done this yourself. Guess what? When the, your children are going to be in the desert, I'm not going to give them water directly. I'm going to have a messenger give them the water. And that's the rock that the Jewish people received that water from in the desert was sort of a punishment to Abraham for him not doing it himself. And then we have the Battle of Amalek. So our sages tell us a very interesting idea. And that is, you know, imagine that you are, uh, you are, um, you, you're going, there, there's a, a swimming pool or a jacuzzi, and the water is, you know, 200 degrees. It's so hot. And, uh, you know, everyone's terrified. Should I go in? Should I go? No, I can't go in. It's too hot. It's too hot. And then you have one clown who just, he says, you know what, I'm going to go in. And he jumps in and burns his whole body. But you know what he just did aside from burning himself? By jumping in, he now cooled it off for everybody else. So now everybody else is not afraid to try it. And what was happening here is that everybody feared the Jewish people. At this moment in history, everybody feared the Jewish people. And here these Amalek nation, this nation decided, you know what, we're not afraid of the Jewish people, even though we are, but we're going to start a war, even though we know we're going to lose, but we're going to cool it off for everybody else. Now nobody's afraid. And today we see that there is no nation. Uh, you know, we had a declaration of Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, being recognized by the United States, and you see how many nations voted against it, right? The Jewish people are always going to be challenged by the nations of the world, and that's our that's almost our joy in the sense that we're held accountable. We're held, there's a responsibility that we have as, uh, as being the chosen people to be an example to the nation, nations of the world. So uh, we take it with, with a tremendous uh, you know, burden of responsibility, but that's our, that's, our, um, that's our task. That's why we're here, and that's why we're the chosen people. But the Battle of Amalek is one that's, that's particularly important because they were the first to start up with us. It's like we were that hot water. No one wants to touch it. No one, you're going to burn yourself. And they were, they were uh, beat by the Jewish people, but by miracles of the Almighty, of course, but um, they cooled it off. So now all the other nations weren't afraid to start up with the Jews. And we see that till today, all the nations don't fear fighting with the Jews. Portion number five and number six deal with the accepting of the Torah, and that's Parshas Yisra and Mishpatim. So the Mishnah, the, the, sorry, the, the portion of, of Yisra begins with Yisra heard, and yet Jethro heard. Who was Yisra? Yisra was Moshe's father-in-law. And uh, it says that he heard. What did he hear? So my grandfather would always say this, you know, people were sitting over there reading their uh, Sinai, uh, Sinai today, and they were reading the uh, the Egypt Post, and they were reading uh, you know the the Saudi uh, the the Saudi the Saudi uh, news, and even, maybe even the New York Times, maybe. And they see their, their, they open up their paper and they're reading it, and it's like 
wow, look at the Jewish people. The Jewish people got, gave the 10 plagues to the Egyptians and God split the sea to them on dry land and the Egyptians were all drowned and they had the, the battle. In the, first, they received the manna in the desert where they weren't going to have any food and they got, uh, they got water coming out of a rock and the Amalekites came to fight this defenseless nation and everyone just continues reading the paper like we do every day. Just continue reading. But one person heard that message. And one person said, this is not an ordinary thing. I want to be part of this magic. I want to be part of these people. And that was Yisro. Yisro heard. And that's why, not by coincidence, the Ten Commandments, the revelation at Mount Sinai, is specifically in the portion that is named for someone who was at that point, not even Jewish. Because we learned something great from such a person. The power of listening to our messages. Listen, there's a message being transmitted. Wake up to that message and act upon it. Jethro reacted and joined the people. Of course, there's great rejoicing. He also gives advice to Moshe. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, this, this guy comes over to the leader of the people who just got, you know, he says, you know, management, management skills, right? And he gives his advice and he does some leadership training. And we know that 50 days later after the Jewish people left Egypt, they're standing at the foot of Mount Sinai and they're preparing for receiving the Torah. And finally, the day of revelation, and it's a national revelation. Now, interestingly, most other religions, not most, all other religions have revelations as well. But the difference between Jewish the Jewish transcription of the revelation versus others is that ours is a public revelation, an irrefutable public revelation, right? So it's critically important for us to have that public revelation because, you see, if I just told all of you tonight watching here, um, I am Hashem your God and uh, believe and follow everything that I write to you in this book, because, um, because I took you out of uh, Baytown and brought you to Galveston. And you'll be scratching your heads and say, what, what are you talking about, right? I'm like, because you were all there and you all saw it. You all experienced it. And you're saying to yourself, uh, no, we didn't, right? With all due respect, you never did such a thing. You never took us out of Baytown. You never brought us to Galveston. So what are you talking about? And therefore, we have to follow all of your commandments? But the Jewish people, we have a public revelation. It's not to an individual. It's to everyone. And it's talking about the testimony of every... Uh, it, it's giving the testimony of experiences that we've all experienced. So, if you look at Islam, it was one individual who had a dream. Right? Uh, you know, Muhammad had a dream and... Uh, and uh, God came to him and said, the Jewish people aren't the chosen ones anymore, and it's now it's me. Well, that doesn't either make any sense. First, is it's, it's to an individual, right? So that doesn't make much sense because, you know, if there are two brothers fighting over a, an inheritance, and one brother comes to the other and says, you know, it's the money comes to me. He says, why, why does it go to you? Because dad came to me in a dream last night, and he told me it comes to me. So what would the other brother say? He said, it's the stupidest thing ever. If dad wanted you to get the money, he'd come to me in the dream. And he'd tell me to give it to you. But he didn't come to me. He came to you, so I don't believe him. So it's interesting that Christianity has the same idea. It was an individual who had some revelation. Right? There's no public revelation. It's allegedly they had, they had a revelation. In Judaism, we don't work with, you know, anything that isn't, concrete and the revelation of god at mount sinai is a public revelation one that everyone had to experience in order for it to be valid and for everyone to feel a connection to it even to this very day 3300 years after the experience at mount sinai the revelation of mount sinai so it's very interesting that the first of the ten commandments the ten commandments are being revealed by god and to the Jewish people. And the first of the Ten Commandments, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, it's the commandment to know Hashem, your God. And what is, what is the example given? And it's, it's, really, it's really surprising 
right? Anochi Hashem I am Hashem your God that took you out of Egypt. Now I ask you, and you can comment here on Facebook, right? Is that the greatest thing that God ever did? Take the Jewish people out of Egypt? I would beg to say that, uh, you know, taking the Jewish people, uh, not to forget the Jewish people, uh, creation of heaven and earth, the sun and the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, all the animals. I mean, there, there are so many great things. Shabbos, the creation of Shabbos. I mean, there's so many amazing things that could be, God says no. Know that I am Hashem, your God. You know why? Because I took you out of Egypt. I mean, why, why, why pick that? So our sages explain that because creation of heaven and earth, although that was far greater than the exodus from Egypt, but the people didn't experience it. Here, the people experienced the exodus of Egypt. They saw it in their own flesh and blood. They saw it with their own eyes. The exodus was a, 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 a clear understanding to the people who were, experience, were experiencing this revelation. Yeah, this is something that happened to us. And just as that is true, and we've all experienced that we all, 600,000 men above the age, between the ages of 20 and 60, were at the foot of Mount Sinai. So if you do the math, it's 600,000 men between the age of 20 and 60. So you double that for the women, right? So you have already 1.2 million people standing at the foot of Mount Sinai. You add the children who are under the age of uh, 20, so that boys and girls, would, let's say, would be equal to the same amount. So you have another 600,000, which is 1.8 million. Then you have the adults who are, or the seniors who are older than the age of 60 uh, till about 80 or 100 years old. So there'll be, so you're dealing with already uh, 2.4 million people. And then you have all of the Egyptians. You're talking about three, over 3 million people standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, all experiencing the revelation of God. It's, it's an incredible God's revelation to the people in God telling us things that we've experienced. Because if we didn't experience them, if there were things that weren't correct, then you know what would happen? The Jewish people would just toss out the Torah. But they didn't toss it out because it's it's factual. It's accurate. There's not an extra letter. And like I told you, if I gave you a book that declared me as God, and I tell you Baba Mises, right, you'd also throw it out, right? The Jewish people knew that this was actual, uh, this is an actual experience. They knew it, they saw it. Now, the first two commandments are spoken directly by the Almighty. And the Midrash tells us that the Jewish people died and needed to be resuscitated after each of, at the, at the utterance of each of the Ten Commandments, each of the first two, that is. After the first two, from the third and on, they're given already in third person. And that's given through Moses, because the Jewish people said, we can't, every time God is telling us a commandment, there's such a, an intense infusion of spirituality, boom, we pop like a balloon, right? Because it's too much spirituality. Our, our physical bodies couldn't, uh, contain such a, an intensity of spiritual growth. So the first is, I am Hashem, your God. The second is, no other God before you, before me. And we have the foundation of our covenant with God. We have, the revelation is too powerful. The Jewish people, uh, the Jews couldn't hear directly from God anymore. The third commandment is already in third person. We say, don't say God's name in vain. Moses, uh, the, the Ten Commandments we have, on this sheet that you'll have, you'll get next week, hopefully. And that is, again, faith in God, idolatry is prohibited, prohibition in vain oaths, the Shabbos, honoring your father and mother, the prohibition against murder, the prohibition against adultery, prohibition against stealing, the prohibition against bearing false witness, and the prohibition against jealousy and coveting. So we're done with the portion of, no, not yet done. And Moses ascends to receive the rest of the Torah and gives over the oral explanations to everything that he learns. Now, we know, we've discussed this multiple times, that because something is written in, everything is written in the Torah and is written in code, so the explanation to it 
needs to be attached to it. Now, there are some people who don't understand this and think that the oral Torah is just a bunch of rabbis trying to make up rules. That's a very, very shallow and uh, grave misunderstanding of the Torah and how important the oral Torah is uh, to understanding the written Torah. Uh, but the oral Torah is part of the written Torah. Even though it was transmitted orally and later written, um, it is the actual Torah. We have proofs to this in the Talmud. The Talmud uh, talks about how both Torahs were given. The Torah that is written and given, and the Torah that's oral and transmitted through generations, and only later written by Rabbeinu HaKadosh in the Mishnah, and later explained by the Tanaic sages in the Talmud, and then further explained through you know, the likes of Maimonides, and Nachmanides, and Rashi, and the Shulchan Aruch, and so on and so forth. Okay, in the sixth portion of Mishpatim, we have the second part of the accepting of the Torah, which is the ordinances. We're given the civil laws, the teaching of sensitivities, like we've uh, discussed that uh, if you had a slave, the slave master had to, and you only had one pillow, you had to give it to your slave. You had to give it to your servant. You can't eat before feeding your animals. You had to, right? You have all of these laws that the world has incorporated in our society um, are all from the Torah, the Torah values. And you should be very proud uh, that this is your Torah. Uh, and you should therefore take the time to read it, to learn it, to know it, and hopefully to live it. So the commandment to observe the day of rest for the land, uh, uh, for the land and for the week. So the land is for Shemitah, right? For the seventh year, the sabbatical year. And we also have a sabbatical of every day of the week, which is the Shabbos, which is, which is weekly. We have the three pilgrimages, uh, pilgrimage festival, festivals, which are Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. And then we have the promise of the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, will be given to the Jewish people. And as we know, the Jewish people over the past seven, almost seven years have been greatly enjoying the incredible uh, and holy land of Israel. Now, it is 7.58 on my clock, um, and in two minutes, Rabbi Yaakov Walby will be teaching his class, uh, uh, the class that was um, originally scheduled. Um, I'm going to share with you the link for that class right over here in our broadcast. So if you look in the comments section here, you'll see I just added the... Um, no, it's not showing, so I don't know what we can do. It should show in a minute. Um, the the uh, broadcast for Rabbi Yaakov's class, I invite you all to join that class. Um, this class is going to end right now. We're going to continue next week, again at uh, 7 o'clock p.m. at the Torch Center on Tuesday. We're going to hopefully complete the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, and hopefully have all of these magnificent handouts for everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And as you uh, will remember, the Torah never stops. So no matter if the weather is is uh, is not favorable, uh, we still continue teaching our Torah. Uh, my brother will be beginning in one minute on his Facebook page. So please join him and join me uh, in joining him. And I look forward to seeing everyone. Oh, here you go. You got the links here. You got the links here. So for whatever reason, it was not uh, showing. It is showing. So you can click on that link, join my brother's video, and have a magnificent evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Don't forget to stay safe and uh, drive carefully if you're driving, and don't do anything that I wouldn't. Uh, have a lovely evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us.